song is an thank you to the Burberry Club of Beer. I appreciate everybody being here on this beautiful Friday. Getting ready for Thanksgiving weekend. A lot of family in. And, uh, so this is a shocking surprise that I'm introducing. I actually am the one who invited John because I met him on a ski trip uh, that Dave uh, got us together on. But I completely forgot to prepare anything. No one actually told me that was part of my job. <laughs> so, I was going to do the song and dance, but well, I guess you're going to get to do it. I, I got a few jokes if you want me to get back. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> well, uh, so I, I think what I'm going to do is let John tell his, uh, tell his uh, own uh, biography since I didn't write it all down here. But I will say, you can see up here, this is an Everest story from a local Knoxville guy and has not just your average Everest story, a very interesting one. So if you'll welcome John, I think you're going to really like this. Yeah. <laughs> share of my trip last spring and it was rather eventful. All of my mountain trips tend to be eventful. They tend to be high to drama episodes in one form or another. Uh, somebody asked, well, how long did it take you to climb Everest? And I said, 15 years. And that's the truth. That's when I started working on this project uh, 15 years ago. And so it kind of all came together for me last spring. And I've had the wonderful opportunity to be able to share this with lots of different groups, but probably the hardest act to follow was the uh, 103rd graders at Sam Houston Elementary School, so I want you to be on your question game when I'm done, okay? Uh, but not before last, I got to share with my church at Second Presbyterian, and you know, I went from the beginning of my climbing experience up until last night, or up until this last trip the other night, and obviously won't have time to do that, so you're spared all of that stuff, but instead of going through all the mountains that it took to get to Everest, and you'd be surprised why I even have to say that, because a lot of people come up and go, oh, so you decided to climb Everest and you went and did it. Not really. It doesn't work that way. This is the tallest mountain on earth. So you do have to do a little bit of preparation. And I feel like you have to kind of pay your dues on the lower mountains. And I paid a lot of dues, but not as many as some others. So before I got into the Everest story, I kind of wanted to do a shout out to some of my teammates from a previous trip. And... Um, in 2013, along my journey to Everest, I went to Broad Peak to climb that mountain in Pakistan. And uh, if, if you've ever read about a mountaineering story, it usually involves a tragedy, and this one was a great tragedy, unfortunately, uh, because I lost three of my teammates. Uh, and that's them over there. I also lost two other friends, Marty Denali Schmidt, who tried to rescue my other teammates, and they were all uh, killed. Uh, the three on Broad Peak and Marty and Denali were killed on K2. Um, I'm mentioning this for several reasons. Um, that was sort of a very figural event for me um, in 2013 when that happened. So I penned a book about it that uh, kind of summarized the whole story there. But it ended up being like the worst climate season Pakistan had ever seen. Uh, so my book is called Tempting the Throne Room. And, uh, but if you want to pick that up, it's on Amazon. I've got a few copies. But, so we'll fast forward a little bit from all the mountains that I didn't get to the top of to the one that I did get to the top of. And the truth is with Everest, most people have to climb that mountain three times before they summit. Let's do a little math. At 60 grand a pop, I was only going to get one shot. Uh, I call it my thinner thighs in 60 days program. I lost 25 pounds and $40,000 out of my wallet. <laughs> but to, for me with Everest, it was sort of a fluke in that I didn't know last year was going to be my Everest year. I was kind of trained for a mountain, don't know where it's going to be. And Everest started trending on my timeline and got in my sights. And I got invited on three different expeditions. Didn't go on any one of them. I want to do my own thing, so I went on the south side. And taught my girlfriend into going with me. And she's a very intrepid adventurer who likes to hike and backpack. And uh, we we started our trip as as you know, he's done the Everest trip, is you fly into Lukla, which is probably the most harrowing experience of the, of the whole journey because you're landing in an airport that uh, the runway is uphill. So you feel like you crash landed when you actually get the, the runway. And uh, from there you start what was for us a 10 day trek and I think yours is like 15, right? Up and back. Up and yeah. back, yeah. So I was going to base camp. My girlfriend Laurel was going to base camp with me and so we started there 
And these are just some of the views along the way. That uh, that mountain there is one of the sacred mountains up near Namche Bazaar called Tham Serku. I'm asking you to kind of note that because uh, just look at the top of that mountain, tuck it away in your head for a second. And then, you know, just a few of the views of the track in, which is absolutely gorgeous, one of the best tracks I've ever made. It's also a very civilized track. You have the tea houses, you have uh, you, you can stop and drink beer going up through there. Where else can you do that on a mountaineering expedition? <laughs> uh, you can, you know, have a meal prepared for you. You don't have to tent camp. So it's fairly, it's very civilized. Um, just, just more, every time you round a corner, there's another beautiful, breathtaking vista. Um, the, the average base camp track portion is very doable. It's very cheap. Uh, I would encourage everybody, if you have any kind of notion, put, put that in your bucket list because it's, it's worth doing. Now we're getting up towards the snow line up below the last human outpost, which is called Gorak Shep. Gorak Shep is about 16,000 feet and some change. So you're getting pretty high, you're getting into the snow. Um, and, and now we're actually right outside of base camp. You look at these mountains and you might, Everest is one of those mountains, but it's not the one you think it is. Um, see if my legs are pointing up. There it is. Oh, Mark's here, but not there. You would think Everest is the tallest one there. It's not. That that mountain there is Nupse. The one in the middle is Lotse, and Everest is actually the one over here on the left that looks smaller. It's just all a matter of perception. Mm -hmm. So this is the view of base camp from Pumori. I decided to do my acclimatization on a nearby peak and kind of do some runs up another peak instead of going through the most dangerous part of an Everest climb, which is the Kumbu Icefall. I don't know if y'all have read any of the books, The End of Thin Airs, if y'all familiar with some of those. You may have seen the movie. All the bad stuff that happens on Everest tends to happen in the Kumbu Icefall. And that's where you have these 40-ton blocks of ice, and it's a moving river of frozen glacial stuff that's just always trying to steal your life. It's a very dangerous place. That's where all the ladder crossings are. So I wanted to do my acclimatization on Pumori, and that's why I got this great shot of our base camp. You can see the little dots of tent down there. And uh, that's just another view of base camp. Base camp weather was variable. You know, it could be snowy, it could be warm. But one kind of important thing happened in base camp, and that is that my girlfriend developed serious altitude sickness uh, in the form of uh, what they call acute mountain sickness bordering on pulmonary edema. Um, so she had to be evacuated from base camp, but I teased her because I said, I think you were just trying to get a cheap helicopter ride back down to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> um, she, she's kind of given to receiving altitude sickness. We were on another climb in Mexico and she got it. So we knew this was a possibility, so I got her to upgrade on the rescue insurance. And so she, she got down and was fine and everything. And, and I, I could sort of focus on the climb now. Uh, the trek in, as beautiful as it was, you always have that mountain of Everest hanging over your shoulder. You know, it's always, well, this is beautiful, but I gotta go climb the highest mountain on earth. So you're not enjoying it in a way that, that you would like to probably. So the climbing starts there. This is the beginning of the Kumbu Icefall. You'll, you'll leave for an alpine start about three o'clock in the morning when the ice is frozen the most, and you'll move through the Kumbu Icefall. Um, these are just a few shots of going through the icefall. And it is every bit as scary as it looks, I can tell you. Um, cognizant of the history of bad things happening in there, you're always looking for that next thing to tumble or that next thing to move or that screw to pull out of the ice or any number of maladies that are notorious for the region. <clears throat> then you get to these, and this is what everybody wants to know about in the Kundu. So to cross the crevasses, and some of them are 100 feet deep, you have to lash some ladders together to get across it. <clears throat> this is a three ladder crossing. And of course you're making this in the middle of the night sometimes. And that's what it looks like. <laughs> If you're lucky, you'll get a great Sherpa like I had. The guy in the back, his name is Angawa Sherpa. Best Sherpa in the country, I promise you. He's holding those ropes tight for my friend Stefan. And the trick on the ladder crossings is what you want to do is get your crampons and stick them in between the rungs of the ladder and lean forward. I learned if you put your weight forward, then you, you're more secure. You certainly don't want to lean back. But the only problem with that is you might get your crampons stuck. This is actually a video that I took while crossing a ladder section. Gosh. After all these
these years, is that seriously the best they can come up with? <laughs> it moves every night. So you can't put anything permanent in there. Every night, this thing moves. The, the route was different every time we went through it. Not looking down is sometimes as wise. <laughs> Now, if we fell right there, you know, you can see we're attached to the caravan to the road, but you don't want to fall there. I mean, you just don't. It, it's a nightmare trying to get back up that road to get out and have everybody try to hoist you to get your pack. Uh, you generally just don't want to fall. Then when you get done with that, you come up on these types of deals. They're like Dr. Seuss made up you know, scenarios where they throw snows on top of rocks, on top of ladders, and you have to figure out a creative way to get up it. This was right outside of camp, between camp one and camp two. And um, then, of course, to get back down, you rappel down the roads. You climb Everest many times. You have to go up and down to acclimatize. You will go stock a camp, put some stuff up there, come back, sort of stash things. And that helps your body get used to, you know, the altitude. A lot of people have issues. There's a lot of attrition on an Everest expedition. You know, you're going to lose a lot of your folks. We lost several of our Sherpa due to accidents. We had uh, snow blindness, a broken foot. We had pulmonary edema. Um, it, Everest is just a game of attrition. And what you want to do is stay healthy. You want to stay focused, make sure your gear is good. You've got a lot invested in this climb. Money-wise, I've never spent that kind of money on a car. So, <laughs> I did, fortunately, had a little bit of sponsorship, which helped. This is uh, Camp 2 in the Western Coombe. And the reason I asked you to note the mountain earlier, that mountain, Tham Serku, was at the same elevation as this camp is right now. That's just from perspective's sake. So we're at uh, 21,000 feet right here. At, at this elevation, we're higher than any mountain in North America, and most all of them in South America. Denali is only, Mount McKinley is only 20,320 feet. I had the privilege of doing Denali in 2007, had a great experience over there, but I was also aware that I was sleeping on the summit of Denali every night I was there here at Camp 2. We're not on oxygen here yet. Um, some of you, well, nobody would know I climbed Everest if it wasn't for what I'm about to tell you about. But as, as is always the case with my climbs, there's some high altitude drama that ensues. Uh, this particular case, uh, my friend Neil and I and our two Sherpa, uh, his Sherpa was Sange and mine is Angdawa, were getting ready to go up what's probably the most technical section of Everest climbs between Camp 2 and Camp 3 on the Lodse face. The Lodse face is a sheer wall of ice about 45 degrees. And so it's very precipitous. It's also very uh, prone to rockfall. Uh, and that, I don't know why the pointer's not working, but anyways, that ice wall over there is the load safe face. Now, what we do is we set a camp up about three quarters of the way up in there, about right up in there somewhere. And it's so uncomfortable and so dangerous that the Sherpa won't even sleep there. They're very superstitious about Camp 3. A lot of people have gone out in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and fallen to their deaths at Camp 3. It's just a place where you're not comfortable. You're on the side of an ice cliff. But we had acclimatized. We came back down into the valley, the Kumbu. We went all the way back down to Namche Bazaar, hiked all the way back down to get some more red blood cells, kind of get ourselves healthy, get ready for the summit push, waiting for them to fix the ropes so we could go to the summit. So now we're on the second rotation, and as we're going up, we hear a noise, and uh, what has happened is someone has dislodged a pretty good sized rock, and it has stricken this unfortunate Sherpa porter in the head. <coughs> and so Neil and I were, you know, a, a little ways behind him, and he was just kind of sitting there, and actually hit two Sherpa, and one guy, it just ripped his down suit. So he was more scared than injured. Uh, but this guy was, was injured, injured like badly, like in a way I've never seen. I'm not a medical person. I know this is a lunchtime thing, so I won't get into details about it. But he was in very, very bad shape, like near death kind of. Uh, his skull was exposed. Um, so we had, we had to do a couple things. We had to get him off of this rope. 
and that song gate right there disconnecting him from the rope. We had to get him to a flat place and address the wound. <coughs> then, though, that was actually the easy part. The hard part was getting him back down almost to Camp 2 so that we could get a rescue. Now, because he's Nepali, he's a Sherpa, he doesn't have that good rescue insurance that my girlfriend has, the reluctance to pick him up via helicopter uh, is, it, it was the big issue. Fortunately for me, my friend Neil, who is Canadian, he's uh, of, of Indian descent, and so he speaks Hindi, is that right? Yeah, he speaks Hindi and a little bit of Nepali, but all the Nepalis speak Hindi because they watch Bollywood movies. <laughs> <laughs> so he could get on the horn to our base camp and plead with them to come pick up young Cherry Dorje Sherpa, and uh, it took a long time, a lot of cajoling. The net effect of this was that it pushed our summit plan back a whole day. So we didn't get back into Camp 3 this day until after dark, which is way later you're supposed to be getting into Camp 3. That's, sorry, that's the time I'll make that up. This is a video from Camp 3. Um, just to give you a little perspective of what it's like being up there, being the view, the just <clears throat> kind of how steep it is there, what our tents look like. You're looking back down to Camp 2, way down the valley down there. It was during this part when we left from Camp 3. Now you're really, really starting to smell the death zone. The death zone is 8,000 meters. 8,000 meters is 26,000 feet. They call it the death zone for a lot of reasons, but if you've read the end of thin airs, you know that's where the body starts breaking down. But for, for my benefit, I've never used bottled oxygen on any of my climbs. This is the fourth <coughs> Himalayan climb, first time I've ever used bottled oxygen, and it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take you to sea level, though. I mean, somebody described it as it lowers your elevation by 2,000 feet, and that's, that's the most accurate way I can describe it. But when you're at 23,000, you feel like you're at 21, that puts me back at camp two where I didn't need oxygen. So that's very nice. But now we slept on it at Camp 3, and we're so late, now we're pushing up to Camp 4. We're going over two prominent features on an average climb. One of them, uh, it's just a nice view. That's looking back down to the western tomb, Camp 2. This is called the Geneva Spur. That's sort of your last big, uh, your big obstacle before you get into Camp 4, which is where all the bad stuff in the thin air happens. And this is the South Call Camp 4, the notorious, uh, one of the highest campsites in the world. This is where you launch the summit push from. You can see that once you get to Camp 4 at 26,000 feet, you're already higher than the majority of all mountains on Earth right here. Look at what you've got to climb in Camp 4. It's like they put another mountain on top of a mountain. <laughs> well, we got in so late, we were supposed to leave at about 9 o'clock at night for the summit. I didn't get into Camp four until 7.30 because of the whole Sherpa incident. I'd already pretty much mentally abandoned the climb. I was checked out because I knew that was my deal breaker. That's the thing that's going to knock me out of this summit. So I just became a tourist at that point. Um, we, oh, I got some more work. Well, so we spent a whole day up there just resting, relaxing, drinking water, eating, hoping maybe we could go the next night. It was a good thing we didn't go that night. The weather was bad. Well, the next night came around, and my Sherpa, uh, Angdawa, came and got me out of 10 about 7 o'clock. He said, you ready to go? And I was like, it's 7 o'clock at night. He's like, that's right. Well, he knows how slow I am. <laughs> <laughs> he drove me up that mountain for the past two months, so he knew that at age 51, I was a bit older than everybody else on the team, and I kind of took my time getting up through there. I say take my time. I checked my heart rate mm -hmm. sitting at the South Call, and it was 102 resting on oxygen. So you can imagine, you know, what, what your maximum heart rate is when you get up through there. I didn't want to reach that 178 level, so I would go slower. And he uh, planned accordingly, smart guy. So I was the first person to take off for the summit of Everest on May the 22nd of this year. So we go up this feature here called the triangular face, and then you get up to a place called the balcony. So I left at 7.30, I got up to the balcony, which is where we change oxygen, uh, right there at about... It was probably about 10 hours later, and the temperature when we left the South Call was 15 below zero. 
I got pretty severe frostbite several years ago on a climb in western China. When you get frostbite, it's sort of a mountaineering disease. You're, you're susceptible to it for life. Uh, and I was aware of that. And my feet did start getting cold at the balcony, and I knew I was probably already flirting with that as a possibility. Uh, but when I got to the balcony, I had to make some decisions. And I was as cold as I've ever been, as miserable as I've ever been, as tired as I've ever been. That was, that was a point where I really did want to turn around. But uh, the sun came up. And when the sun comes up, you always get some new hope, get some new energy. And uh, by the grace of God, he helped me to move on along. Well, by this time, everybody that had started their son of push has passed me. I'm now going from being the first person to climb Everest to the last person going up towards the summit. So from the balcony, we get up to a place called the uh, South Summit of Everest. That's actually what you see in the pictures. Is uh, The South Summit is, uh, is in its own right an 8,000 meter peak, but it's part of Everest. And it would be the second highest mountain on Earth if it were just a freestanding mountain alone. So when I got to the South Summit, a couple of things happened. It was now already 9 o'clock in the morning. I had left at uh, 7, 7.30 the night before, constantly moving. Been awake for three days, hadn't really eaten much, and I drank about a quart of water and I ate a goo gel. That's all I had. Um, I got to the South Summit and all my buddies, Neil and everybody, was coming down. They're, they were like, oh, you know. I was like, well, I know my turnaround times and I know the weather and it looks good and I knew myself. Um, a couple things happened though when I got to the South Summit. I could actually see the Summit Ridge and some of these famous uh, Cornish Traverse and things you read about in the mountaineering books. And I thought, you know, I think I can do this. I'm pretty sure I'm ready to move on. And dog goes, well, you better move on because you got one out. And I was like, oh, wow, no pressure there. <laughs> um, but I sort of got to an out-of-body deal there. Right at that point in time, uh, people were like, what was it like? I said, when I got to the South Summit and I could see the Summit Ridge of Everest, there's nothing that was going to stop me at that point. And it was like, I'm here. I'm not doing this two more times. I, I'm in, I'm, I've got some gas in the tank, and uh, what I've already done, my toes, I've done it, you know, and I'm just going to go ahead. So uh, I just said that little prayer of, you know, I don't know what it is you want me to do, God, but if, if it is, let's get it done right now because I've only got an hour. And uh, I don't remember my feet touching the ground from that point. I really don't. Uh, the next thing I knew, we were crossing these features like the Hillary Step, which arguably doesn't exist anymore. If you've done your reading, some people say that famous uh, last obstacle before the summit doesn't exist. I don't know, because I've never been up there, so I can't tell you, you know, what it was compared to something else. I remember crossing sort of our last objective hazard, and it wasn't that bad. Um, this is a picture that Neil took. Neil, again, he came, summit before I came down, but his picture is so much cooler, so I stole it. But that's just the summit ridge approaching the final steps to the top of Mount Everest. This is uh, not working. Well, I guess you won't get to see my summit video. Oh. Alan. Alan can help. Yeah, I feel like you waited this far. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see the There we go. All right. There we go, Alan. Okay, this is, all right, this is right before the summit video. I've got two videos. This is approaching the last steps to the summit. Um, you see the plume coming off of, if you ever see Everest like you probably did on the track, you, that plume is the notice, that's how you know it's Everest. That plume of snow comes off the top. And I'm sitting there taking photos and you don't see Ang Dawa, he's up there going. <laughs> <laughs> this was Ang Dawa's second Everest summit. The first time he had summited from the north side which is a whole different ball game, and I'm on the traditional route, the south side, the side that uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzin Norgay took. So at 10 o'clock in the morning on May the 23rd, this year, um, is that the same? Is that one? replay on the same one? I think it's the same one. How do I stop that? I should stop. Is that the one of the things? Okay, thank you. And there, I made it to the summit at 10 o'clock a.m., May 23rd, 2004. What was so cool about my summit, you could climb it a million more times, and you'll never have this happen, but I, I think this is just providential. I'm Presbyterian, we'll say, but uh, it was also, in a way, they, they say karma, but 
uh, getting out there so late that I had it all for herself. <laughs> You'll never see anybody else's summit photo that doesn't have 15 other people in it. Well, that's because they were all smart enough to get up there earlier than I did. <laughs> but Ain't and I had the summit of Everest to ourselves. So we were up there for an unheard of 45 minutes. And this video plays, you'll see why we were able to sit there so long. There we go. I'm going to let this play a little bit in the background. You can kind of see what it looks like to be on the summit of Everest. <laughs> I'd give a shout out to my sponsor. There you go. <laughs> 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 I was pointing out all the prominent uh, peaks around me, and I'm like a drunk out of my head trying to figure out where I am and why I'm sitting on this snow spot. Those are Tibetan prayer flags which signify the summit. Uh, if you know anything about Buddhist culture, those prayer flags, what they mean is every time that they write their prayers on it, but every time it flaps in the wind, it supposedly sends the prayer up to heaven. That's my dad's radio station. In Morristown, if you ever do Morristown. <laughs> Who's taking the video? Uh, my Sherpa, Angola. Oh. Yeah. Angola Sherpa. Right I'm Sherpa holding it right there. Right uh, there. 20 below. Oh, yeah. Nice and I've got my hand out. <laughs> and not thinking 100% clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't frostbite my, uh, my fingers, though. I did frostbite my toes. And they're still... I learned with frostbite it takes six months to the day, almost. When you get frostbite, that's how long you've got it. I've still got a little bit of frostbite on the toes that I frostbite while I was up there. But it wasn't near as serious as the first time around when I had to go to UT and sit in the hyperbaric oxygen chambers. They treated me in Kathmandu with this one and uh, charged me $80. <laughs> How are you feeling right now? What are you, what are you thinking? Oh, I, right then it was just, let's get uh, all these little notes and things I wanted to photograph mm -hmm. out you know, before the film froze up. Because my camera totally froze up. And so that's why I had to use the GoPro. Uh, so I was trying to just get all that done. but. I don't know. I, I've watched this so many times, I, I can't really get back in that headspace because it was just so surreal. But we had good weather, as you can see. There were clouds that were coming in, but you know, if you spend time outside, you have a little bit of a sense of what when the weather's coming and when it when it's not. I knew there's there's always a storm coming on Everest, but it didn't come until I got well back to the South Call, 24 hours after I left. My buddy's Corvette shop had to get that. <laughs> You'd be surprised at things that people gave me to take out there. Yeah, you needed that 45 minutes to get all your ads in. <laughs> you get all the advertising in. And of course, I took it all because I was like, you have no idea I'm not getting anywhere near the summit. Well, and I did. And this one is funny. That's, a, that's not my grandfather, as everybody thinks. That's John Muir. Oh. I carry his picture around at the request of some friends. I always want to see John Muir on the top of summits. Aren't your hands getting cold? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I had to get Sherpa to tell me to put my hand back in the glove. Who's John Muir? Who's John Muir next to Jesus Christ, the greatest man that ever lived? He, uh, John Muir is the kind of patron saint of the American National Park uh, System. He's a naturalist, conservative, outdoor person. Uh, lived in the early 1900s. He's the one who talked Teddy Roosevelt into sort of designated Yosemite as the first national park. So uh, John Muir kind of holds a special place to me just for that reason. I, I feel like we're kindred spirits. I'm an outdoor person, so big, big Muir fan. <coughs> this, indulge me one second. What I've got here is a note that was given to me. I'm a drug counselor by trade, so I work with teenagers and adults. One of my teenage kids, his mom died of a drug overdose. When he found out I was going to Everest, he gave me a note to take to his mom, to read, to place up there. Again, in my head, I was getting nowhere near the summit. He didn't know my history of not summoning things. <laughs> sure, Michael, I'll take the note and I'll, I'll, you know, whatever. And then I actually got up there and I saved that for the last. I didn't know what to do with it. And uh, Angawa had the good sense to take the note from me and put it and tie it in a prayer flag. So I really enjoy getting to explain that to Michael the significance of every time that flag flapped in the wind and sent that prayer up to heaven. 
That's me and Angda always taking a little victory lap. Over there. <laughs> this is what I looked like when I got back. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not too pretty. <laughs> <laughs> tells a more. Oh, I haven't changed clothes in that? seven days. This is at Camp Two now. Oh, so this is, uh, you know, again, probably now five days really without sleep. Laying down a little bit, but no sleep. Constantly moving in the death zone, back down to camp two, uh, back all the way down to Lotse Face again, and that you know that's how I felt. I can relate to that picture. <laughs> I remember that. <clears throat> now we had one more thing to do, and that was get through the Kumbu Ice Fall. No matter what you do on Everest, you better have your game on when you get through the Kumbu. I was frostbitten. One of our girls was snow blind, and another one of our guys had broken his foot. We're the walking wounded comes through the most dangerous part of any mountain on earth. So I got to this point and I thought, I've summoned at Everest, which is a miracle. And I'm not going to live to be able to tell anybody about it. It's, it's avalanche and all the way around me. It's way late down in here. Mm. Where the last people coming off, they're not maintaining the route. It's a totally different route. Um, oh, it, was, it was the scariest part of my whole trip because I thought, seriously, I'm three quarters of the way done and I'm not going to be able to make it. And the avalanches were rolling, you know, not past us, but you could hear them coming past us. You could see them over in the distance. And it was it, it was warm. It was too warm to be there. It was 10 in the morning. We should have been there at 7 in the morning. But we had all these wounded people, myself included. Uh, that's the top of the Kumu Ice Fall. That's base camp at the bottom. But I made it, and that was in Kathmandu, and they treated my foot, so I'm back in the frostbite game again. It's all right. It's a familiar kind of scene. And that's just a little gift that my buddy Neil made from the South Call. Last thing I want to say is, because of his heroism and bravery in executing this rescue, he did the bulk of the work. Uh, he's Canadian. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police is issuing him a Canada Medal for Bravery. Wow. He deserves every bit of it. He's the one that got the helicopter up there to save Cherry Gorge's life. And had it not been for Neil, that guy would be dead. So I'm proud of him. Very proud of him. We didn't know each other before this trip, but we ended up joining forces and sharing our shirt and kind of making our, our own plan. So, uh, that was my summer vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know there's uh, hikers left up on the mountain. Did you see a lot of how many are up there and how many did you see? And then the other question is, how did the early guys get over those crevasses? You know, they didn't have the ladders and stuff, the, the first ones up there, Hillary or whoever. Yeah. You know, would you believe they used dynamite to blow up some of those ice blocks in those days? They actually did that. They would build ladders, but they didn't realize how that thing moved so much. They'd have to go back every night and redo it, too. Um, you can't climb the same mountain twice. I never climbed the Kumbu Ice Ball the same route any four times I went through it. Uh, what was your first? Oh, the bodies. Yeah. Uh, one guy died. And uh, they, were, they were lowering his body down when I got up above Camp 3. That was fortunately the only death that I personally you know, witnessed at a body. All the other bodies are moved off the route on the south side. On the north side, everybody knows about Green Boots. He's a famous dead guy who's up above between Camp 4 and 5 and the 5th step who has green boots. And I had three buddies that climbed the north side. He's still there. He's a landmark, really, over there. So there's a lot of bodies on the north side that they can't get off of the mountain. The ones on the south side, they could kind of roll off. Yes, sir. Did your friends die going up or coming down? My friends on Broad Peak? Yeah, well, the ones on Broad Peak, they died. They had actually summoned Broad Peak and got lost on the way down. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. From base camp to summit and back, how many days? On our summit push, I think, ugh. We were probably up above the ice fall for nine days, just on the summit push. Yeah. Plus, the, well, before that, how many days? Well, I mean, the whole trip was 60 days is how long I was over there, and minus the 10 days getting to base camp, maybe another five days. So, you know, you had 35, 40 solid climbing days. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. What do you say? Tell us what a Sherpa is and why they call them that. Yeah, a Sherpa is just an indigenous Nepali, and that's the name of their... Uh, that's what they call their sort of tribe, I guess you'd say. But to be a, a climbing Sherpa, you need to be part of a certain family, sort of. To you know, if, if you're not a certain kind of Sherpa, you're going to be a cook, or you're going to be a uh, porter, 
but to be a climbing Sherpa, that's a prestigious uh, sort of uh, distinction. And, and that means you've, I mean, these guys are incredible. They are high altitude performers, and they're, but they're native Nepalese who live in the Kumbu region, live at high altitudes. Yes, sir. Now that you've accomplished such a rare, amazing feat, does it make you think about what Hillary and Norgay did? Absolutely. And how they did that? Yeah, I had fixed ropes all the way up through there. They fixed their own ropes. They had camps all the way up through there. They had to ferry tons of gear, and they didn't have a path to follow. So, yes, I have ultimate respect for what they did, especially crossing through the Kumbu at that point in time. It, was, it, it really gives tremendous respect for what they did. Yeah. Okay, so after Everest, what's next? <laughs> I mean, like, what do you do now? <laughs> well, Everest is the tallest mountain on Earth, but it's certainly not the most technically difficult. I do have other mountains in my sights. I'm looking to go back to Pakistan year after next, so, yeah. What did you eat? Up and up above base camp, we were eating dehydrated stuff. We'd eat some rice and lentils and things like that, some couscous, things you could digest. <laughs> yeah, let's thank John. <laughs> wow, what an incredible journey. I'll tell you what, I, I don't know how, but uh, the one thing that we bothered me the most is how do you go to the bathroom? Bottle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we really do appreciate you being with us and sharing your story and your adventure. Uh, Andy has shared, uh, his, he's an adventurer too, and shared some of his stuff. Uh, so he's got one up on you, Andy, I guess. I <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot up on no, <laughs> uh, We uh, honor our speakers. Uh, we, we support the Pine Gap Elementary School Library, and uh, we have a book that we'll present uh, in your honor to them. Uh, uh, this is Willa of the Wood. So, you'll uh, and, a, and a, another small token of our appreciation for you being here tonight. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, sir. we have uh, a special event today. It's the first one we've had since I've been president, and it's, so it's a very exciting very exciting day. I'm going to ask uh, uh, our newest to be member, uh, Libby Dirty. Libby, if you'll come up, uh, Dick Hinton is going to do the charge, and then your sponsoring member, uh, Anita Hinderlock. So, uh, Libby, it's uh, with my great pleasure uh, on behalf of the board of directors and the members of the Rotary Club of Bearden to welcome you as a new member. Uh, we welcome you not only for the fellowship, uh, also, but for your talents and abilities that will help us carry out our projects in the community and the world and make it a better place to live. Rotary is not a political organization, but all Rotarians are pledged to be good citizens and electing men and women to public office who are of a high character. Rotary is not a charitable organization, but much of what we do is giving back. We feel that we have a responsibility to help others. Rotary is not a religious organization, <coughs> but it is built on the strong ethical principles of integrity, dignity, and service to others. Rotary is an organization of people pledged to uphold the highest professional standards. Rotarians believe that worldwide fellowship and international peace can be achieved when leaders unite under the banner of service. Well, I'll now turn it over to Dick to present the charge. Yeah, everyone stand, please. Uh, and uh, like most organizations, Rotary has its traditions, and inductions of new members is one of those. One of our founding members, Bob Ely. Uh, by the way, we still have one, Art Pickle. He's here back in the back. But another one, Bob Ely, for many years gave the charge. So I'm going to use some of the words that Bob used to use just to kind of bring some of those back to memory. Uh, membership in Rotary is not available to everyone. It's by invitation only. You must first be proposed by a current member, then the board of directors and the membership must approve you. They have. You're now a member of Rotary, but not yet a Rotarian. In other words, you'll be getting a pen, a certificate, and some other material to 
just in a few minutes. But to be a Rotarian, there are some additional expectations, and that, let me name just three of them. The first is to serve. Service above self is our motto, but it's more than that. It's really the primary reason we exist. Second of all, I challenge you to uphold the four-way test. It's right here. We say it every meeting in the way that you conduct your business and the way you are just in the world. And third of all, Libby, I want you really to become a part of this club, an integral part of this club. I want you to come to the meetings. I want you to participate in the projects that we have, the fundraisers that we have, and have fun with us. Get to know us and become a vital part of this club. Uh, the first time, I'll tell this to the group, the first time I ever talked to Libby, I think it was the first time you visited here. Yeah, she was excitedly telling me about that she had a Rotary scholarship that uh, she said she had years ago, and it was from this club. So I think she was very curious about this club and interested in maybe joining it someday. So I'm especially pleased to be able to help with that. And you did something else, I think. Uh, we can the stream clean up. This, is, this person, after visiting a couple of times, did a volunteer project. She put on old clothes and was out there with John Hines cleaning up the stream as not even a member yet. So that tells me good things are to come uh, with you, Libby. I, you'll have a world of volunteer activities here and all around the world available to you. Um, I think you're going to be a dynamic member of our club, and I look forward to seeing where you can take us. So I, your sponsoring member, I ask to come forward and invest you with the distinguishing badge of a Rotarian. Here, here. And I offer you the Rotary Hand of Friendship. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> I don't know where her pen is. It's in, there it's is. in the phone. It's right there where it says, Welcome to Rotary. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, and y'all will make notes that it's her first day as an official member, and she has a name tag already. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> got much better at that rather than waiting around for a couple months. Oh, like eight years? Or whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Um, and then we have a couple of other Well, I am absolutely delighted. Okay, this won't hurt a bit. <laughs> Look away. <laughs> Congratulations and welcome, Miss Libby. Y'all can sit back down. Uh, before we uh, we'll have, uh, we need to get a photo here in a minute. But uh, yeah, you can. Y'all can we'll let Libby stay up here just for a minute, and then we'll get a photo in a minute. Okay. We're gonna leave her up to our staff just for a second. Uh, I just wanted to. Uh, there is a membership packet here that has your membership certificate. Uh, Boy test, uh, object of rotary, uh, there's a new member checklist. Uh, Anita is your official sponsor, and I also have something. But Anita, you have to come back down. Oh, here. sure. Right. Okay, That's here we go. You too. I have a pen for you uh, for being a, uh, a member sponsor. Well, uh, so, uh, and also, uh, our theme this year is Be the Inspiration. That's a, I have one on, you don't have to wear it, but. Uh, uh, yes, Rotary loves pens, and we, so we have lots of pens. Uh, but I wanted to uh, present that information information to you. I appreciate, uh, appreciate Jared and his hard work on the membership committee. Uh, and it's great to have you in our club. And if you wanted to take a minute and yeah, tell us please. a little something about yourself. And after the meeting, we would uh, it'd be great. Uh, uh, Part of the charge of being a new member is when you can when you can be here for the first few <coughs> meetings or so to be out front kind of as a greeter and to so you can put names and faces together. Uh, Janice is working on our uh, our new directory and that'll help too uh, to help kind of get to know everybody. Uh, so if you wouldn't tell us a little about a little bit about yourself. Thank you and thank you so much um, thank you so much for um, letting me join and be a member of the Rotary Club of Bearden. Um, I, I'm Libby Durding. I was a Rotary Foundation um, International Ambassadorial Scholar sponsored by what was then the West Knoxville Club um, in 95 to 96. And I studied in Swansea, Wales for a year. And uh, it was part of my grad school education. I came back here to UT and finished my master's in English. And a lot of the thesis um, that I wrote in creative writing and poetry really was spurred from that year abroad. Um, and it, it just was such a meaningful year. And I always said, um, 
spent the last 20 years in DC. I went to DC for law school and stayed up there working in nonprofits primarily, um, doing lobbying and law for them. And I've always said when I was ready to move back to Tennessee, one of the first things I was going to do is go back and join the Rotary Club and try to give back and, um, and help you all do your work here in the community and, um, and feel like I was returning um, the, the service that, that I got from the club originally. So I'm very excited to um, be a member and get to work. <laughs> Great to have you. Y'all will, when you can, introduce yourself to, to Libby uh, and start that friendship. Uh, just a few quick, uh, is, the, is the bell ringing sign-up sheet around? Is it full? Is it full? Not yet. Not yet? All right. You've got to have it full. Y'all please sign up. Uh, mobile meals, any um, announcements? Yeah, we had a, a couple of new clients, and um, I don't know if you noticed, but the Mobile Meal has um, a, a elementary school that makes birthday cards for people whose birthdays are during the week when Mobile Meals are delivered. And the cards are given to us, and as a deliverer, we get to give the card to the uh, clients. So um, I sang Happy Birthday to one of the ladies today, and she cried, and I don't know if it was because of singing Happy Birthday or what it was. And she couldn't remember how old she was. <laughs> but anyway, we hugged each other and everything was cool. And if you'd like to be a part of this wonderful mobile meals delivery, uh, just talk to me and let's get you signed up and uh, visit with us and, um, and you can be a deliverer and I'd love to have you. Thank you. Uh, any other announcements? Yeah, David? Uh, tomorrow night, um, we're having our largest fundraiser for the Tennessee Dance Ensemble. These girls are fantastic. They do beautiful, beautiful work in Knoxville and all over the United States, so they're nationally recognized. It's going to mm -hmm. start tomorrow at 6 o'clock behind the new Catholic school. Uh, we, it's an uh, online, online live auction right there. And anything in Knoxville that you want is going to be there, from the best restaurants, the wine, whatever you want. We've got it there, and I appreciate anybody coming out tomorrow about 6 o'clock for sports. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you for working on that. Go back. If everybody will bring your badge up, if you want to talk, that's fine, but bring your badge up here first. Andy's <laughs> <laughs> uh, got a, someone meeting at his house, and he used to get out here a little earlier today. So drop your name badge off, and then come back in and talk. Uh, thanks uh, to David and Tammy and Dave and John for being with us today, being our guests. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, where Peyton is. Gary, you want to lead us in a four-way test? I, I sure will. <laughs> the four-way test of the things things say or do. First, is, is it true? true? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Here, Andy. Remember, no meeting next week. I don't want to be caught. <laughs> <laughs> 